you. Good morning and happy new year, Deborah. How are you doing? Good to see you. Good to see you. So you're at Williams. Here I am in the studio. Yeah, so we're uh, we're here in the uh, SCOW Science Library, which is closed off, unfortunately, because of the pandemic. So that's why we have to do this video this way. But uh, we'll be able to look at uh, our sculptures here um, close up and, and talk a little bit about the art and the mathematics behind them. So I found myself remembering uh, that first time I met you at Winter Study, when I discovered that you <laughs> also knew a lot about Penrose. And I had been interested in it when I was a student at the Royal College. So I was in my 20s and absolutely fascinated by it. I said to you um, something like, I want to make it 3D. And you said, oh, you can. But I meant, I meant it to look 3D. I was looking at trying to create some sort of faux um, three-dimensional effect. I, I work in two dimensions. I'm a, you know, I make stained glass windows. I draw and I don't, I've never really made sculpture until now. And when, what you meant was, hey, we can bring this thing out of two dimensions and build it in 3D. I'm a computer scientist, but I was raised as a mathematician. So it's a lot of mathematics done by uh, various honor students I had. And we also work in 2D all the time, you know, thinking about tilings. And the cool thing is that, uh, you know, when we got working together, I began to realize that all the features that my students were discovering about these tilings were really emphasized by bringing them out into three dimensions. Definitely. It was an yeah. epiphany. So let's talk about this first tiling. This is actually not in the Bridges gallery, the, the, the pictures in the gallery, but it's an important one because uh, what this is, is a, a three-dimensional interpretation, I guess you would call it, of a, of a Penrose tiling. And so for anybody watching uh, who, who knows the Penrose tiling, um, be aware that this is a three-dimensional object. But when we look at it, when we project it onto a two-dimensional screen, it looks exactly like a Penrose tiling. The idea of this came from uh, De Bruyne's paper on pentagrids. There, uh, he uh, identified projections from five-dimensional square lattices to the Penrose tilings by taking a two-dimensional plane that cuts through five space at what I'll call an irrational angle, so it never hits any integer lattice point. And what we're seeing here are the features of five-dimensional space, the closest ones to that plane projected onto the plane. Yeah, the key thing to say is in a Penrose tiling in two dimensions, we need two different ROMs. Yeah. When we work in three dimensions, we need a single rhombus. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. In that sculpture, every single rhombus is exactly the same shape. Right, right. It's a golden rhombus. There's a certain right. proportion, obviously. So, but so it, the, the way yeah. you look at it, you see it as if they were thick and thin according to the tilt. So I, I want to say something about the experience of building it, because when we started building these, we thought, I remember you had really complex number diagrams. And what yeah. I discovered in the actual building, and I discovered it with the very first one that I built in glass, which it, it was that it's actually as intuitive as building a cube out of six squares. In other words, if you had six squares and they were, you know, these sides were joined and these sides were joined, you brought them all up 90 degrees, it would make a cube. You couldn't not build a cube. Yeah. You followed very simple instructions. And this is exactly the same, that if you abide by the rule that there are only four vertex heights, including the tabletop, it kind of wants to be. We had many good arguments about color. And in the <laughs> end, you were in charge, the artist was in charge of color because you really had that figured out. And, it's, and, and the only constraint was you had to live by the mathematical rules and then otherwise okay. you could do whatever you want. We, we, we did, Dwayne. We have had fun, i got to say, because if I feel like you're just talking about numbers and I want to see, I want beautiful craftsmanship. I want beautiful objects that are like seductive in their own way. So right. I think between us, we kind of got this nice push and pull going there with our different skills. So we're going to move on to the next sculpture. I do want to say that all these sculptures are physically exactly the same. The next one is called cloaking device. Dwayne, will you come in from the edge first before you show a 90 degree face on one? So people can see the disorder in it. Cause this looks like it's just random colors, but it's 10 different colored pieces in this sculpture that represent the 10 different possible orientations. And there are only 10, there's no more. And you need all 10. The red tiles form a square grid 
in phi space. And uh, it's just because the plane is cutting through at an angle that we see that they're, they're separated by distance. If we come and we look down here, we see it's a very green dimension. You need always to assess the position of the viewer. We're looking at something which will be different depending upon which direction you look at it. Let's move on to the next one, which is really, from a mathematical point of view, the most interesting. This work is sort of an homage to the late John Conway, who, who described the idea of forcing patterns in a tiling. So the goal here is we're going to see a start pattern, which we're going to call the seed. It forces the structure around it to have a particular topology. Any tile that is dark is forced into position by that seed. There seem to be places where the sculpture makes a, a choice, for want of a better term, how it's going to work out. I met the Ochen's team at Brown who were building quasi crystals, and, and I first noticed them because I saw some of the photographs and I saw some similarities to some of the stuff that we've been learning. Right. I've, I've also made these in plastic and filled them with water. And when you fill them with water, you can see more patterns developing from them. But um, what I was interested in, just fascinated by, is that the way Ochen's team have been doing it is that they're building these quasi crystals on the surface of a liquid. I see the surface tension of the water providing a, sur a surface and then gravity providing another surface. And it, it kind of makes sense to me. I do think of it as being like a cosmic sheet of corrugated cardboard. There's yeah. some force coming up and there's some force coming down and it will go to infinity. But to a certain extent, it's not too surprising that if we see quasi crystals forming in nature, we're probably just discovering the simplest ones we can construct early on. But I'm not creating anything new. I'm just I'm discovering something that exists. And I'm really, really curious about the properties of what exists. And the, the pleasure and the sort of intellectual curiosity has been all fueled around, whoa, what happens if we code this one in this way? Right. What happens if we color every single one of those five rosettes that faces up the ways differently from the ones that face downwards? Right. What right. new patterns generate? What can right. I find? My lofty and probably impossible goal is to answer Penrose's question in one of his really early papers, which is, how on earth does nature do it? So how does nature build these structures? And how does this kind of choosing mechanism affect the way a crystal grows? Some of the work that I've done since you and I worked on these is yeah. I've been doing a lot of artist residencies, first at Mass Mocha and then at Gentel in Wyoming and then in Playa in, in Southern Oregon you know, various other places that have given me masses of time to sort of go to sleep thinking about this, building this, observing what's happening when you build, and then wake up the next morning with, you know, new insights cooking. Being a maker and a craftsman, which is what I've done in my whole life, is that when you, when I do something with my hands and with my body, there's a very different kind of learning that takes place. Like, I feel like we could, couldn't live long enough to just explore everything that's going on there. It's very, yeah. it's very beautiful. It's just a beautiful structure.